Okay, hello, welcome to part two of my Demon Souls gameplay. We're going to pick up straight off from where we were last time, so for the next hour or so, enjoy joining me on my journey of hopefully not very much death, but probably some death. Oh, this is so cool looking. Oh, it's got a map full of people. Nice. I expected the wing to catch the uh, castle wall and knock it down, but it didn't. So you'll see people all the time in this game who are the phantoms from other worlds, that person there. They're other players who are playing right now in this same place and you see bits of them. The lore explanation for that is the, the um, like the multiverse theory there's lots of interconnected worlds and they sort of pass each other a little bit so you get little moments of interconnectedness and then the way that the pvp and pve um, multiplayer works is you're essentially going into other people's worlds to help them or attack them or vice versa um, so there's actually lore explanation as to why it works and how those messages work as well because the messages are placed by other players in other worlds and then that's one of the things that can cross worlds. So this is just absolutely spectacular. I don't know if the rest of the game holds up to this but the outside of the Gates of Water area, holy shit, this is so cool looking. It has this destroyed beauty look about it which is one of my favourite aesthetics. It's this grand royal expensive perfection that's been ruined and it's oh so good great message okay combat um <laughs> then whilst trying to hit them with my wand rather than just using the uh, one hit kill magic so this is what I was talking about when I said the start of the game is quite easy with royalty because all of these enemies, or most of them, at this stage of the game can be killed in one hit with the soul arrow and my MP recharges with the ring I've got so I effectively never run out. If you touch the bloodstains it's essentially where other players died recently, so you get to see a little replay of their red phantom dying. So if you go to an area and you see there's tons of bloodstains on the floor, probably means there's going to be enemies around at some point. So it can help you. There's a gate down there. That means at some point we'll get to open it and get a shortcut. Also, one of the most satisfying parts of Bloodborne was moving around this world that you don't understand and you don't have a map or anything and then discovering a gate you can open after ages of wandering into uncharted territory and unlocking a shortcut so you can get back there again same thing happens in this which is so cool i love it that feeling of opening passageways and connecting the world together and realizing that a place where you were is closer to somewhere else that you know about than you thought is oh, so good but at this stage we can't open it Why don't we have places like this in real life? Not, you know, on fire, but this kind of structure is just so cool. In case you don't know, Scotland isn't quite like this. So this is where I'm only just starting to get the hang of the input lag situation. So starting to learn how to dodge properly. Roll. 
I said before, in Bloodborne, I was a big roll out the way, then attack person. So my play style is very much that. <laughs> Everyone's very weak at this point in the game. But you can still die. Like, one of the things about the Soulsborne games is even the most basic enemies, if you just don't pay attention for a few seconds, will kill you and have lasting consequences. If you spend hours playing the game and collect some loads of souls, which are the currency and the leveling system, you can die and lose them all, and then if you can't get back to your body, they're gone forever. Like, there's real consequence. Which is what makes it so good. Good appraisal messages here. Seeing some more death. I don't know how people have died here, to be honest. But who knows, maybe the other classes are useless at this stage. If you don't have a one-hit kill soul arrow. I wish there was a way of aiming magic attacks that wasn't just based on the lock-on that I'm using. It'd be real, real handy if I could just have some kind of reticle. It's probably based on, um, you know, proximity. Uh, if, if I could aim a reticle and I can fire the magic with server, it would be a lot more powerful. Now, I don't understand how that works. Why that attack did 138 damage instead of 99 damage. Because the only thing I did different is I didn't aim it. I just pressed R1 to fire, to fire the attack. Um, and it hit him by chance and did more damage. So I'm not sure whether there are different ways of casting that are more powerful but more risky, like they might miss. Um, or it was because he jumped, and he was in a more vulnerable position as he jumped. There's another gate that we might get to at some point. Love crows. Favourite bird. Oh, I heard that in my right earphone. In, when I was playing the game, I didn't realise that that noise came specifically from the right, so this would be a reason to play with headphones or at least some kind of directional surround sound system because you can hear where things are coming from so thankfully i've got magic and thankfully it's ridiculously powerful so these are people who've been driven to madness by the fog demon situation so you can see from the way they attack is it's very um well, that does 138 damage as well. What's that about? I don't think I locked onto that. I'm sure it was when I run and don't lock on and do the magic attack, it does higher damage. But it is a lot harder to hit. The destruction physics are really cool. You can't destroy, like, a bit of them, though. Like, it's completely destroyed or not at all. But the way they collapse and bounce off things is really nice. It reminds me of all of the games on PS3 that use the Havoc physics engine and it's really satisfying that used to be my main thing back in the times of like Killzone 2 was the physics of games um, I did study physics because of I was too obsessed with this type of thing and in Killzone the way you could shoot like the bottom of a high pressure barrel and then it starts spinning and taking off in the direction that that vector would actually make it go um, which also happens in Just Cause, but Killzone 2 was the first time I saw it, and it was so cool, and I loved it. This has a nice little destruction physics that remind me of that. <laughs> Typical Souls game. That's what happens. And that! That's exactly what happens. You get scared, you roll away, and you fall down a hole and die. So there were signs next to that hole saying something like treasure ahead, which were obviously the people who were trying to troll. This is me checking out the menu system and also realizing that the game does not pause 
when you go into the menu. So you can see the game in the background is still on. You can still get attacked and die. There is no way of pausing while it's on. I'm not sure whether going to the home screen of the PlayStation pauses it or not. I've not experimented with that. But within the game, you can't pause it. Oh, here we can see that there's the, um, the arch stones from before and the missing one. But it's definitely there. Just broken. Okay, in display... You can see the uh, cinematic versus performance setting, which I think I start playing with in a minute to see if I can tell the difference. For the sake of this gameplay, I'm going to skip my testing of that because I'm going to make a separate video where I compare the performance and cinematic modes. Um, I think for the most part, I run on performance in this gameplay because it does run at a smoother frame rate. I just don't know whether the visual improvements of cinematic are enough to justify a few dropped frames. I've got very, very low tolerance for bad frame rates. I'm not necessarily a stickler for, you know, needing 120 frames a second, but I want 60. I want a solid 60. When things are at 30, or especially when they're periodically dropping below, it drives me insane. This is the photo mode, which obviously is really beautiful, but things are static because it's photo mode, whereas I think a lot of the beauty from this game comes in the subtle movements of beautiful scenes. So I prefer to get beauty by using um, a telescope, which you get later. So you can just look at a scene and disable a hood and just have things gently moving. I think that's a better way to do the photo mode than, than this. Unless obviously you want photos. But I think the moving scenes in this game are where most of the beauty is at. Okay, I spent far too long in photo mode. We're back. So, because I died, everyone's back, which is great. So here I'm obviously passing around a little bit less. I'm just going to use the magic plough through them, I hope. I have to get back to where I died, which thankfully isn't too far away, in order to get my souls back, and then everything's fine again. But this is the risky time in the Soulsborne games, is after you've died once, trying to get back to retrieve your souls without dying again, because if you do die again, that's when you lose everything. So, this is when you should be careful. The temptation, of course, is to get impatient and just sprint through, which works sometimes. And I've done that many times in Bloodborne. Um, we just run, get your souls, and then try not to die. But if you do die, at least if you've got them, you'll drop them again and have another chance. Whereas you die, if you die before getting them, that's when you're fucked. So I have to wait till we get within, you know, 10 meters or so before I can do the lock-on. That was funny. They just died from wandering into the fire. That wasn't even me. But the fire effects are so beautiful. The scale of these gates is just... Fantastic. You can't see the um, the lighting effects of the magic as well when you're outdoors in an open space like this. It's mainly when you're inside that you can see how cool it is. Talking about blue lighting, ambulance going past in the background. And the more times you do this, and you don't do it many, many times, the more you learn the enemy placements and the quicker you're able to get through them with less difficulty. So we're already nearly back where I died. Thankfully, usually when you die next to a hole, uh, the souls will be just next to it rather than obviously inside it where it would be impossible. The arrows also move, ex move extremely slowly. <laughs> oh, he's having a bad time. You can 
here for the noises that they make, how like, desperate they are. Since we the train with the madness. And it's almost like you give them a release from the pain of their existence when you actually kill them. So they, that's where I died. And you can see, just over there, there's a little pool of blood with a blue light above it. That's my souls that I can collect. There we are. In retrospect, it was barely any souls anyway, so it wouldn't have made a big difference. But at this stage, it's most of what I had. I'm glad that I got them back. This is also one of those times where you will eventually go down there, like all of the areas that you see in these like holes that you can't get to just yet will interconnect. So knowing that there's a tunneling region, maybe the tunnel underground area is down there and that's where it's connected to. And maybe that same area links to that gate we saw earlier at the start. Maybe, I don't know. Speculation. Bad time for rolling. See, that's good advice. Because if you roll too close to that hole, that's when you fall down. That's what happened to me earlier. Now we're going to some very dark scenes. So this is where the magic is actually extremely helpful just to see what's going on. Loving the medieval feel to this. See how bright the room gets when you cast. Really nice lighting. Yeah, the wand doesn't really destroy anything if you'd use the melee attack, but you can knock apples out of a bowl, which is good to know. Sword, of course, can actually destroy things. Not the beds, though. The beds are indestructible. But tables, little boxes, they can go. Really nice lighting on those steps. Look at that. Shadows on the steps. The way you can see the top of them is illuminated by the sky. Okay, I was getting distracted by looking at those things that I could destroy. And looking how beautiful this church is. Oh. oh, don't you want to go up there? We're going to. Nice sword noises. I was panicking a little bit. I don't know why I wasn't just using magic at this point. Running back where you came from is always a good tactic if you know you've cleared enemies out from an area. If you just get some distance away from a stronger enemy, especially if you've got a ranged attack like the magic, you can do this. I was also sort of hoping that you'd fall into the hole. And I nearly fell in now, actually. I think I roll very close to it. Yeah, that roll could have very easily have gone in a different direction, but it was fine. I could spend hours just looking at these things. Don't know why I'm wasting magic, just trying to destroy things. Look at the destruction physics! Oh, so satisfying. The one died here, that's not a surprise. So, is this a dodgy fog door? Or is it a friendly one? We don't know. It could be a horrific boss that's going to kill us. Could just be a new area. Oh, I think this is where... So, I was worried that it was going to be a dodgy boss. So, this is me running all the way back to the Nexus. 
hoping that there's some way of saving my souls at this stage. Because as we know, well, as you might know from Bloodborne, um, if you play, I'm assuming you've played Bloodborne, I don't know why, but anyway, in Bloodborne, you can go back to the Hunter's Dream and exchange your blood echoes, you know, the, the equivalent of the souls, for levelling up. So this stage is like, surely by now I've I've been through so much, I've you know risked so much to get these souls. There must be a way of using them by now. So I end up going back to the Nexus, in the hopes that there is. And it's a waste of time. So I'm probably going to skip it because there's nothing we can do with the souls just yet. So we're going to come back to the Gates of Boletaria. Um I'll probably just bring the gameplay back in as we get back to where we were before, because I have to run through the whole thing again and kill everyone again, and that's going to be very boring for you to watch. Okay, we're back where we were before, and we're about to go through the scary gates. Is it a boss? No. So, we're going into the next area inside the walls of uh, Boletaria. Oh, scary ghost. And someone throwing firebombs, nice and friendly, so it was good to see that. Great start, but you did at least get to see that as that fire adorned my body, it lit up all of the walls around and it's very beautiful. Also at this stage, I thought I'll be all cinematic and I'll turn off the hood because this game is so beautiful without a hood, it's very nice to see. Um, and then I didn't realize that without having the HB gauge, you can die very easily. So it's a good job I ran out of there and healed. Nice. So for a little bit now, I do play with no hood so you can enjoy all of the splendor of this beautiful lighting which is what I'm here for look for enemy nice reading that now like I said before the glitchy appraisal text situation you can see how the number of upvotes is sort of blended in with the word appraisal so hopefully they'll fix that at some point Those fire swords look. Such nice effects. The contrast of the blue from my magic with the red from all this fire is really, really nice as well. That doesn't make any sense. And because I'm in soul form at the moment, because I've died a few times, um, my body, of course, has that blue glow to it. Magic. See that travel along the wall. And that lovely little wind up sound as the magic goes. Oh, it's so good. So satisfying. I'm being very slow. Um, because you have to remember at this stage, I don't know what's going on. I don't know the way anywhere. I don't know where strong enemies are. Um, once you've done this a few times, as I said, you, you go back through way faster once you know who's around and what's going on. So here, I'm shitting myself because there's fire bombs coming from the sky. Turns out there's someone on that platform above me. And the only way of really getting them at this stage is running up the steps and then firing behind me and then hoping no one else comes through that archway. I see there are people here. I turn around <laughs> and try and attack this guy. Takes a couple of hits. But I get his soul, which sounds horrific to say. And these ones haven't attacked me, so it's all fine. It's a completely valid tactic. It must be extremely annoying to play, though, without any ranged weapons. I'm guessing you have to rely on things like fire bombs and maybe the, um, the throwing knives. This guy's annoying. He always runs away after you hit him, and it takes two to kill him, and then he always runs just behind that. Don't worry, we'll see him again. In a minute. So frustrated. I hit this wall with my wand. Talking about frustration. There's an item trapped in that wood. 
that I did not get. I should actually probably go back there um, now that I know how to get it. This is the dangerous part because I'm so distracted by this view that I will happily die looking at the view rather than checking if there are enemies around. But this is just a oh, beautiful place. I still don't have the hood on, which is a good job at this stage. Look at that. Okay, come on, up the stairs. It's not stairs. Up the ramp. The guy's just standing there, ready to die. And here's the other one from before that I nearly killed with that magic attack and then ran behind the wall. I don't know why I'm lagging out. I'm probably worried about my health because without the health meter, I just have to guess and I think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm probably about to die. I should probably check, but I'm also interested in looking at the church. Okay. It was easy because he barely had any health left. But when you're not using a hood, the only way of checking your health is to pause. I say pause. Go into the menu. It doesn't actually pause the game. Oh, that's such a nice perspective. Looking at the views. Come on, Chris. Oh, look at the fog in the distance and those cliffs going in and out. And, oh, so nice. I'm enjoying just watching this again because it's so, so cool. Once again, some volumetric lighting illuminated by the item on the ground. Dodgy creaking noises. There's the item down there that I couldn't get. Um, you'll see how you get it in a second. And I can't believe that when I was playing it, it didn't click with me that that's how. Okay, messages. Useful to read messages on the ground. Could be a hidden foe. Ooh. Time for rolling. Ha 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 ha. I'm way too obsessed with trying to get in here. Come on. Stop stabbing the planks. Oh, look. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm checking my health. <laughs> I'm at about half health, so I'll take a little, little crescent. Now I'm at full health. Ready to die by boulder. I don't know why I ran so far up. I knew what was going to happen. So it turns out that that is what destroys... Uh, and you can actually go up there where I just ran past. You can go up there now and get that item, which I can't believe I just missed. That's why I said time for rolling, because it's a boulder and you've got to roll out of the way. It's actually a good message. I wish I used magic here. Really nice perspective. You can see the top of the, you know, the building there, just framed by the like, path as you go up. It's just there's so, so many amazing level design perspectives in this game, and I stare at them for far too long and get hit by arrows constantly. That's just what happens. So we're on top of the wall around Volataria here, where you can see all of the trebuchets and some kind of a long reach. Much easier if you use magic. It did take me a while to uh, cotton on that the magic is a good idea. Considering I've got an open soul arrow and basically unlimited MP. I don't know why I wasn't using it sooner. Also, when you don't have the hood on, you can't see what items you're picking up, which is really annoying. So it, it, it is better to have it on. There are various dynamic settings which make certain elements of it turn on and off at different times. But I still couldn't get it to all go away to film cinematic parts, so I still ended up turning it off manually when I wanted to film something, and then turning it on again when I was actually playing and worried about dying. Like, loads of times I'll do that, I'll go into the pause, and I'll be like, oh shit, I've got, like, no health left, and it was chance that I just didn't die. Um, and in this game, you really don't want to leave dying up to chance, because it can really screw you over. Okay, this is the path to the church. Useful to read messages, which I did not do. Look at this scary looking individual guarding the church. This is a familiar looking knight. Earlier in the tutorial section we encountered the blue eye knight, which wasn't too bad, we managed it. This is not the blue eye knight. Oh. This is the red eye knight. Ha 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 ha, as you can tell. Um, and he's quite a lot stronger. So I still don't have the hood on because I'm thick. <laughs> 
and uh, I quickly realized that my magic was doing, like, no damage. Not that I could see it. Yeah. But that's a useful lesson. Encounter a strong enemy, you should be cautious rather than just try and get straight in there and die, because you definitely die when you're just running there like I just did. So now I have to get back to it. But this is nice that you can see from here where I was. I was on that path by the church there. Um, and I, I love that. I've um, One of the things I enjoy most in life in general is seeing things from perspectives and then like placing them in my mind of what connects together. And this game is so good. It gives me that satisfaction of seeing places interlinked together and then realizing where they are. It's great. I love it. This is me being extremely risky. Because I was frustrated that I just lost all those souls because I worked a long time to get to that point um, and I decided to just try and run all the way there. This is the thing that you should not do in the Soulsborne games. But I'm doing it, it's fine. Um, taking healing items. Hood is still off for some reason. What the hell am I doing? Um, I could have easily died at any point watching its attempts. <laughs> Learn from me and don't do this. You're much better just cautiously going through. Because what ends up happening is you got a conga line of enemies behind you all, all trying to track you down. So if you do have to fight someone like I'm doing here, and I just realised that I'd run out of something. Fire bombs probably. But I wouldn't know because I've not got my hood on. Who knows what I was running out of. And now, all those enemies that I ran past are all trampling their way up the stairs. And for some reason, I'm in the pause menu. Oh, I was turning. I was trying to turn the hood back on, and then I realised there's an enemy there. I was pretty uh, in desperation at this point. If any of these five hit me, I would have died. There's three of them on the stairs. I don't have any group attacks. Do I just run? Do I try and go into the menu? Oh. Oh, this is so dodgy. Yep, here we go. I'm desperately looking for the hood. This is part of the gameplay, being like, find the hood as fast as you can, because the, remember, the game doesn't pause. I'm in performance visual mode. Hood, on. I left it on custom. I don't want it on custom, I want it on. Out. Just in time. Still got hit. Nearly dead. Look at the health bar in the corner. Oh, God. I could... I was so close to dying. And remember, I've got all my souls that are on that bridge by the church. I'd, I'd be back at square one if I died again here. Managed to just run past them. Okay, I'm a little bit calmer at this point. Because I have healed. The hood is successfully back on. This is very, very, very early game, so all the drama we're experiencing is just drama I'm making for myself. The actual game has a lot of drama of its own in stuff. Once again, nice third-person camera usage. You know, I'm backed up against a wall. A lot of cameras really freak out in that situation. But in this case, it just got a little bit closer. It turned my character invisible or translucent. I can still see what's going on. I can still control it fine which makes it very satisfying to play even in close quarters situations where traditionally third person games are really quite poor. Okay, here I am... Was I changing items? Oh yeah, I was, I was flicking through my different usable, like consumable items, working out what the hell Noble's Lotus is. I have not encountered any poison, so I don't know if I have use for this flowers. Trying to work out what I should equip in my quick select item situation. All of these numbers are still a mystery to me, by the way. Bloodborne didn't have quite the same, you know, symbols and stuff, so I'm not really aware. I think the sword logo is like damage, and then there's like magical damage and fire damage, the other ones, and there's a durability one. But there's nothing that tells you what your stats 
should be to use a certain weapon because you do come across weapons in the game which you just can't use um because, well it tells you this weapon is not effective or that you can't use this weapon at all or you can use this weapon but only in two-handed mode um because you don't have high enough stats but there's nothing on the weapon selection screen that tells you what that statistic is you just have to guess and then when you're leveling up you put some points into strength for example and then you might see that a weapon suddenly does way more damage but it'd be useful if there was a way of knowing what that level was for the item there might be but i don't know of it oh things are getting dodgy again so I've already done this before, I know where the enemies are, so I should be able to do it quicker. But I think at this point I'm just scared because I know that if I die I'm going to have to, you know, lose all my souls. I've got enemies coming from both sides. Oh, those ones are chilling. They're not coming downstairs. That's fine. Off you go. Run. It's time to actually kill him properly. Well, not so. If you fire off two shots fast enough, you can take him down. Don't know why I keep running back. I'm being way too cautious. Nope. As usual, he escaped from the second one. Sometimes it misses. I don't really know what the accuracy situation is, whether it's RNG um, or it's dependent on, you know, the enemy's movements, but you do miss sometimes. That one usually runs and jumps at you, and you get to disintegrate it in midair. Sometimes it's great. I just love the perspective of seeing down that valley and seeing all of those rock faces that get fainter and fainter as it goes into the distance because of the mist sort of builds up as the distances increase. It's the one that I always nearly kill. Who's just left there with barely any health. Hitting him with the melee attacks of the wand. There we go. Tiny amount of damage is still enough. Great message. See how it says 1186? But it's sort of on top of where it says appraisal, so it looks like it says 86. Okay, the rock stays gone, thankfully, so it doesn't reset the rock. We've just got him there, um, which is much easier to take out if you use the magic. He's having a little stretch. Warm up those shoulders. Once again, as we go up here, just appreciate the, the, the perspective on the top of the castle wall. Um, as we go up, it's just framed, and it's so faint and subtle and just beautiful as it emerges. There's the arrow again. Once again, I'm distracted. Okay, I think I was a bit more tactful this time. Now that I know there's a really strong enemy there that I'm going to have to take out, um, what I would advise is clear out a big area that you can run back into. So in this case, there's a huge pathway down the top of this wall. If you take every enemy out on it, you've got room to run back. And there's a lot of shit on the, way, on the top that's in the way that you can negotiate around and hopefully trap enemies in. So in the whole game, and in a lot of games, that's a good tactic for dealing with strong enemies. Clear a path know what's behind you so that you can run backwards away from them safely without someone sneaking up on you. So I think that's what I do this time. Although I'm probably going to go and get my souls first. The relief that you get in a Soulsborne game when you finally get the souls back after thinking you're going to lose them. Oh, so satisfying. This game is hard, but I wouldn't categorize the Soulsborne games as like, it's just the most difficult gaming experience and that's why it's good. It's not just about the difficulty. It's the way that the difficulty is presented means you have to get a grip and try. And it ends, it's, I think Jim Sterling said, it's a game about hope rather than despair because it forces you to try again and you end up being hopeful of your own success and then when you do eventually achieve it which can take longer than you expect you might have setbacks 
it's so much more satisfying and valuable than if you were just handed it on a platter like in most games. So if you've not played these games before, don't worry that it's just going to be a difficult grind and it's a horrible experience. Um, it's not just that it's beautiful that makes this appealing. It teaches you life lessons about perseverance and hope and pushing through adversity. Um, I know that sounds ridiculous to talk about a game, but it does. It's a genuinely valuable experience. I got that from playing Bloodborne, but obviously a lot of people have got that from playing um, Demon and Dark Souls. And I'm having that same experience again playing this game, which I really appreciate. As you can see, this is a blue-eyed knight who is significantly weaker than the red-eyed knight from the bridge before. So he can block my magic, so it does bugger all damage if he blocks it. But if you hit a few times, obviously he sort of staggers or does a weird animation, and then you can get a few shots in. And it only takes, you know, two or three good, successful, unblocked solar arrow shots to take a blue eye knight down at this stage. So that's fine. I could deal with him. That's all right. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to work out the hierarchy of enemies because I'm, I'm called them a blue eye knight and red eye knights just because that's what they are to me. I don't know if people actually call them that or not. Um, so I'm working out at this stage. Okay, the blue eyes are definitely weaker than the red eyes because that one on the bridge is the only red eye that I've encountered. You can also see how hard people are um, by how many souls you get when you kill them. So uh, most of the enemies in this area, you're getting like six souls from. Then some of them you get like 10 or 20 from. And then that red eye knight was like 300 or something. So obviously he's a lot harder. Um, in this area, I was trying to work out what path I should take, where I should go. So there's a few different options. I can jump down there. Don't know what's down there, but that's an option. There's the scary fog door once again. Might be a boss, might be an area, who knows? Don't want to risk it at this stage. Um, and there's this path over here, which goes down um, this castle wall column situation. Which, if you are aware of the geography of this area, you might be able to work out where it is. It's um, one of the towers that's next to the grand entrance gates to Boletaria. So where we started, uh, when you look forwards and you've got the big gate... This is the top of the column on the left of the gate. So because we've gone along the wall to it, um, this will eventually descend all the way down to the bottom. Now, I do have to go down this, but I can't remember if I go down it now or I come back here. Oh, look at this. I just wasted that firebomb because they killed themselves anyway by hitting the barrels. So I think that's the game trying to teach us that if you do slash at these explosive barrels, you will die. And that's what happened to those poor souls. Nice fire effects in the dark area. Slightly horrifying hearing their screams when they die. There's something human about the enemies, even though they're, you know, meant to be mad. Um, we see them as just enemies, but they have some humanity to them when they're dying, which is very interesting. It's quite tall. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm here going, oh, look, if only I could, like, you know, hit them from here. Look how close together they are. A firebomb would go great. At this stage, I also think firebombs are way more useful than they actually are. They create quite a small explosion, and it's not that powerful. So it's not as helpful as I think it's going to be. But I'm thinking, I can't lock on, but maybe I can just, like, lob a bomb down, and it will hit them, maybe. So I've got about 50,000 of them, so I may as well throw one, see what happens. Um, I was looking in the settings of the controls for an option for uh, zoom, zooming, but like aiming properly. Um, like I mentioned in one of the other videos, I'd like it if this game did have some kind of aiming, like, you know, if you held L2 while using a throwing item, you could, you know, get a curve or a projectile or a crosshair or something, but you can't. Um, I think the bow might be the only thing you can do that with, because it does talk about precision aim here, using bow, precision aim, precision aim, zoom in, etc. So maybe the bow is the only weapon that allows you to do that, but you can't do it with the magic or the firebomb, at least not at this stage. I just wish you could. So now I'm thinking, oh, the only way to do it then is going to be to just lob it and hope for the best.
as you can see, it's just basically a firecracker. Doesn't do that much. They all looked at it though, which is funny. So now I'm thinking, oh, I've got 15, I can use a few. So I'm trying to reposition and work out where I can go to actually hit them with it. Um, oh, it was also so close to just hitting the railing in front of me. But there we go, look, killed one. Did 106 damage. This is the thing, it only does like the same damage as my magic soul arrow. And I've got basically unlimited of those. And I can aim them a bit more precisely. <laughs> um, and the firebomb doesn't even have that much area of effect. I thought the one advantage of it would be, even if it only does 100 damage, it does it over an area so I can take out multiple enemies at once. But not really. It still can only attack one person at a time, most of the time. In my experience, anyway. So this is the path where we started. So we can see we're descending down this left column, like I said, um, next to the Grand Gate. Very pretty. Yeah, we're back in. We're descending down. Clearly at this point I'm thinking, I don't want to fight that knight. <laughs> Which is probably a good call. I got my souls back, but I'm not fighting that red-eye knight just yet. <laughs> Yeah, that's about the max distance the magical work from. Really close to falling off and dying here. I'm surprised you can fire it so down. Handy in this situation. This um, stairwell is almost purely eliminated by fire and magic at this stage. And here we go. Our first satisfying gate opening moment of Demon Souls. We've got our lever. At this point, I'm playing it being like, yes, finally. And there we go. Remember where we are? These enemies should be dead, but they're not because you might remember earlier, I just ran past all of them. So they're all still there. And uh, this gate is going to be permanently open, so it's one of the things that does stay, you know, working, uh, stays as it is in the Soulsborne games. Is when you do open gates and pathways, they stay open. Um, so even if I do die, even if I die twice in a row, even if I lose all my souls, that gate will stay open, which means that I've effectively made permanent progress. So this is not like a roguelike game where every time you die, you start all over again. You do make permanent progress by essentially opening pathways that allow you to get to later game areas easier and by uh, progressing through bosses and enemies that unlock checkpoints. So you know the archstone, touchstone things like where we spawned at here um, and when you're in the nexus the archways that allow you to go to areas. So unlocking those effectively checkpoints. So they're the two ways that you would like make progress in this world. Okay, I've not got anything interesting to say about what's going on here. So I'm just going to skip through a little bit of the gameplay for a little bit. Um, I'm basically just going to mess around, probably go back to the Nexus, hope that I can do something I can't. Because um, I'm like, I've got one and a half thousand souls, I don't want to waste them, I'm going to lose them, I'm going to keep dying. Um, so I'm just going to like look around. I end up going back up again to where I was before. Obviously, thankfully, I can take a shorter route now. So when I come back, I can just go through that gate, which is handy, so I can get back to the top of the wall a lot easier. And I want to explore my remaining three options, which are to kill the Red Eye Knight and explore the church, to go through the dodgy fog door on top of the wall, or to drop down on that little bit at the top of the wall that was the opposite, the fog door. So, you'll join me again as I'm checking out what is there. Okay, we're back. Uh, I have left the Nexus. Uh, all I ended up doing there was repairing some of my weapons that were a tiny bit deteriorated, so spend a few souls. This time, we are going back up, I hope, the correct way, which is this gate I opened earlier. 
So um, this is a new route that I didn't show before because we were coming down it and now that all of the enemies have respawned, we're heading up. Lovely lighting here. Oof. Flash, flash. As you can see, the soul arrow is being extremely useful with all these one-hit kills. That's the lever that we pulled earlier. A lot of explosive barrels though, oh god. Um, if you do have a way of hitting them, it's helpful too, but I don't really. Because I can't aim this magic attack properly to hit barrels. You can't lock onto the barrels. Okay, what am I doing? Don't know what I was doing there. Okay, we're heading up the tower. And now, when I get to the top of the wall, this is where I have to decide if I'm going to take those three options I talked about before. So whether I'm going to jump down the wall, um, where there was some, you know, sign on the floor. You know, someone talking about taking a risk or whatever. Um, there's the foggy, scary door. There's um, the red-eye knight guarding the church. So I can't remember which one I do first. I think I jump down the wall, but I can't be sure. I wish I could get past that. I wish I could jump. That's one of the things I miss doing in this. But I think Demon Souls and the Soulsborne games in general, when you play them, you trust the design enough that you're sort of okay with the decisions they make for the most part. You're like, okay, well, if they don't want me to jump, it's probably for good reason. I probably trust the game design. Um, so I'm not too hung up on it as I would be in a game where I think it's been designed a bit less competently. So I'd like to jump, but I don't care that much. Ooh, I think I just nearly died. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, so we're heading up. We do encounter those barrels from before, and I think I struggled with how to deal with them. I was like, huh, if I hit these, they're going to blow up and kill me. If I try and roll past them, they're probably going to blow up and kill me. I can't really aim my magic at them because I can't lock onto them and there's no reticle. So I sort of tried to hit them a few times and failed miserably, as you can see. But while I'm missing, enjoy seeing all of those lovely blue lighting effects illuminating this dark place. Bit of yellow at the bottom, a bit of red on the right, and a bit of blue everywhere else. Anyway, this doesn't really work. But it turns out they don't blow up on their own. So I couldn't walk past it, weirdly. Like, my character couldn't fit through that gap. So I think I rolled? We're about to find out. Good, good, good to go there. Okay, so I managed to hit one with the magic and it didn't blow up. So I thought if I get into the corner there, maybe if it does blow up, I'm a bit further away from it. So turns out if you hit them with magic, they do not blow up. I don't know what the situation is that makes them blow up. Maybe it's only if they're hit with fire. Uh, maybe the reason it blew up before is because those guys had like fire bombs or fire swords or something. And that's why it blew up. Um, if you do just roll into them, I'm not sure if they do. I don't really want to test it. Oh, look at the innocent little face. Okay, we are now level with the wall. Um, I'm probably just going to attempt to destroy a few things in this room, because why not? And then we're going to go, hopefully, jumping down the side of the wall. and see what's around. I love the lighting. So, I know I say this a lot. This is a really good um, high dynamic range. I, I'm not using an HDR TV. Um, even though it does have a really high contrast ratio, it doesn't officially support HDR. But you can just see a beautiful contrast between uh, dark and light areas. That's what I said before about staggering. If you just hit these shielded enemies a few times, they stagger and you can get a good hit in. That was a blue eye knight, so it doesn't take too many hits to kill him. Um, so yeah, when you're in an indoor scene and you can see the outdoor at the same time, there's a really, really nice display of contrast. Because if you just overboost the darkness of the interior and then pull down the brightness of the exterior, like with photography in real life, it looks ridiculously fake. Um, and that's why a lot of phones doing automatic HDR or amateur photographers doing it um, on their own, it looks terrible because it looks fake. Like if there's too much dynamic range, if dark stuff is too bright, etc. This game does a really good job of 
balancing the levels in a way that looks realistic. It looks similar to how your eyes would actually see it. So you see the bright stuff outside is brighter than the dark stuff inside, but you can still see detail where it should be, especially where the bright light from outside is shining onto, say, the floor of the dark interior space. The ray tracing is then sending that light out into the room, like it's turning that patch of light on the floor into the light source that then illuminates the rest of the room, which is really cool. Like, even at the moment where I'm sat here, I don't have a direct light source on me. I, due to the shape of the room and the fact that the computer's in the corner, I've got um, my light, which is the beauty dish that I use for my classes, is up here, pointing sort of behind me. Like, when I look this way, you can sort of see it, because my face will get really bright. It's pointing this way. Um, so when I'm exposing for my face, my face is actually in shadow. So the light from the light is um, purely highlight, or like a hair light behind me. And then I'm using the reflected light from it to actually fill in my face. So here, I've got a big white piece of map board, which is like a massive white card thing, just so that some of the light that comes from here is reflected off here, effectively making that my light source, even though it's not emitting light. Now, we know that in you know the real world and photographers and stuff, but games traditionally haven't been able to do that. All they could do is... Um, you know, pretend by artistically adding it in, um, the game wouldn't do it itself. But now they do. Anyway, while I've been rambling on about lighting, I jumped down and I found a crossbow. But I can't really use it because I've not got a high enough strength, I think. Uh, but as I mentioned before, there was not a clear indication of how much strength I need um, in order to get more out of it. So I try using it with both hands, which apparently makes it more effective. I'm equipping the 16 bolts that I think I also just found. Great aim. So I still don't have any kind of reticle, any real way of aiming it, so um, I have the same problem as before, effectively. Like when I was using magic, it's the same system. I got the, uh, the, I got the crossbow. It's terrible. Uh, it does not very much damage. You have to lock on to use it. You can't use a reticle. So I'm on balance, not a big fan. I've actually hit anyone with it yet. I've not been paying attention. Good. Getting hit by a firebomb casually. So, I'm trying to hit this guy with the crossbow. Missed, because he's hiding behind a wall. He's also missing by throwing firebombs at the wall, so it's fine, it's even. Yeah, 40 damage. 40. I'm not sure whether that's because of the shield. No, 4. So, so the 40 was without the shield. 4 with the shield. Um, which is terrible, because my soul arrows, which have the same range and the same firing system and effectively unlimited ammo, are doing about 100 damage. So, at the moment, at least, the crossbow is awful. Uh, maybe that's just because of my build. Maybe if I had higher strength or dexterity, it would do more damage. Maybe it will do more damage later when I've got higher stats, but at the moment, completely unusable, not recommended. This is the platform, by the way, where the fire guy was before. In fact, that guy that I just killed was the fire guy who, when I was running up those steps, I don't know if you recognise the area, um, was behind me, lobbing firebombs down. That was him. Seems to have unlimited firebombs. And, yeah, those enemies are still left from before. So if I do go up and around there, I'll end up back on the wall again, which I should do eventually. Uh The magic does feel powerful in this game, which is a problem that I find with magic in a lot of games. It doesn't have an impact to it. In this, it really does. It has like, like a satisfying charge-up time, and then noises, which I love. And when it hits, it really feels like it's making contact with an enemy. You know, you can feel that sort of momentum, which... I mean, the momentum doesn't make sense because it's presumably it's massless. It doesn't succumb to gravity, but um, it feels very satisfying to use. So I am going to be continuing to use magic in this playthrough. 
Um, I don't really know exactly what I'm going to specialise in, but I've got fairly high <laughs> intelligence. Okay, I think I'm finally going back to my nemesis, the Red Eye Knight. Now, I'm no stronger than I was before. Same weapons, same stats, haven't leveled up or anything. Obviously, I've got way more souls than before, which just means I've got more at risk. Um, but I'm a bit scared of going through that foggy door because it might be a boss. And I've got PTSD from the one right at the start of the game that took me out. So, I mentioned last time I was about to face the Red Eye Knight, I think, um, that a good tactic is to clear out this entire top area. So, I've done that now. There are no more enemies in this whole area. There's only the Red Eye Knight, which means I can back way up and run backwards as I'm fighting him and, you know, fire off lots of magic -y bolts. Um, I was prepping some firebombs in case I need them as well. Um, although I think this is where I find out that firebombs are pretty trash. Like I throw them at him and it does bugger all damage. So I'm like, fuck this, I'm just going to stick with the soul arrows. They seem to be more effective. So, see him there, looking demonous. Great message. Actually, it's fairly inaccurate. It's only one enemy. It's annoying me how some of these cauldrons aren't on fire. So there you go. Firebomb, five damage. Obviously, that's because you blocked it, but five, that's so bad. You know, if it does five damage when he blocks it, that means that if he didn't block it, it would still only do, like, 50 damage, which is trash. Sort of thinking, is he gonna follow me? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I can see those hellgast eyes coming through the darkness. Missed, great. So I'm trying to use the trebuchets to throw him off a little bit. Blocked magic is doing nine damage, which on that health bar is nothing. So I'm trying to stagger him. A few hits. A few hits. At some point. There we go, stagger. So I can get a good hit in, 61 damage, 86 on that one. Um, so that's what I have to keep doing. So for my build at least, this is the only tactic I can use against him. I can't get close, I definitely couldn't melee him. Maybe if you're really good at parrying, you can, but especially with the input lag of filming, I could not do that. So whenever he staggers, obviously you've got to hit him again. And we're done. 2,070 souls. That's how you know that it was a tough enemy. So remember, before most enemies are giving us between like 6 and 20, the, um, I think the big long spear guys, 30, and the blue eye, excuse me, the blue eye knights are like 360, 300 something. 2,000 from the Red Eye, so clearly meant to be a much harder enemy. Very, very happy with that, but obviously now I'm risking even more. I've just doubled the amount of souls that I'm carrying around. This is like wandering around a dodgy bit of the city centre with, you know, thousands of pounds slash dollars in your pocket. At this point, that's how it feels to play these games. So now I'm trying to appreciate the beauty of the reflections in these puddles and the beautiful church and the fire and it's just oh, so nice. And once again, I talked before about how satisfying I find um, seeing locations and different, different perspectives. So from here, I love thinking, I was on the ground down there outside the gates looking up at this church and this path and that's where I am now, even though it's in a game. That gives me the same satisfaction as it does in real life. It's so, oh, it's so good. Oh, look at this. Oh, it's gorgeous. Look at the mountains. Once again, this game does a fantastic job of showing you things, like previewing them. So we saw like a glimpse of the mountains over there. The, the two big spike mountains. We'll see them again later. And can we go in? I think I was thinking like, oh god, do I want to open it? Like maybe I'm going to walk into a really high level area or just encounter like what's meant to be the 10th boss of the game because these games 
will do that. They'll just allow you to walk into a really hard area. Um, I've had my warning that Red Eye Knight was probably not meant to be fought and defeated at my level. But I think, oh, okay, it's fine, yeah. I may as well try and go in. Okay, that's it for part two of me playing Demon Souls. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. Of course, the next few videos are still going to have this particular style. I recorded them all in one session. So tune in next time for the continuation of the drama and me playing and me talking about random things and talking far too much about how beautiful the lighting is. Um, hopefully that's the perspective that uh, sticks with people because I'm going to do lots of things on this channel, but it's going to be from the perspective of who I am. So I am a photographer, so even if I'm not doing photography content, it's going to have, you know, mentions of the lighting, photography and whatnot going on. So I hope you enjoyed it. Tune in next time for part three. Bye.